We've been talking about the classification side of support vector machines, but there is also a regression story uh, to be told here. This we really only understood in the 90s, especially the late uh, 90s, uh, when computing power really started to, uh, to pick up. The basis, just as in the classification scenario, the basis is a linear model. The cost function that we're using ends up being a trade-off between explaining the training data that we have and trying to make the coefficients as small as possible. So it feels a lot like our ridge regression type of a configuration. However, what we can do, just as in the classification case, is transform the problem into a dual problem where we implement our queries in terms of computing a weighted sum over the training set uh, elements. The cool thing is that we can use our nonlinear expansions that, that we talked about with the classification side of things. So we can bring to bear our polynomial kernels or our Gaussian kernels or there are a whole variety of other kinds of kernels out there. And in doing so, we can also make use of this kernel trick that we talked about that changes our problem from one of computing inner products of very large dimensional vectors to uh, cases where we're computing inner products of very small uh, vectors. So let's look uh, at a little bit of the math uh, behind this, and then we'll do a little bit of code. All right, I wanted to show just a little bit of the mathematics to give you some intuition as to what's happening. The full derivation is certainly beyond the scope of what we are going to do in this class. So the model forms that, that we're generally looking at are, are the same as what we've seen before. So some query point here, its value is, is just uh, the weights multiplied by a uh, feature vector. In this case, I'm assuming that I have an expanded uh, feature vector. And then there's also that bias term in here. Our cost function looks like this and it should look very familiar. So there's our term for reducing the magnitude of our coefficients, and then there's our term that addresses our errors. So I'm going to take a sum over the entire training set and compute the squared differences between the predicted value and the actual value. So this is Essentially what we have for ridge regression, the difference is that our regularization parameter tends to be uh, on the first term here and not on the, uh, the, the term on the right-hand side. So one can introduce what they call a, a set of Lagrangian multipliers. Again, we're not going to work through the, those details here, but we can represent this function in a dual space. And that looks like this. So y k is sum over the entire training set, and there's a there's an alpha j here, and then a f and then our set of inner products. So phi of x j transpose phi of uh, x k, and of course our there's a plus b here. Okay, so, so the new variable that, that gets introduced as part of the Lagrangian multiplier transformation is, uh, is this alpha here. And in fact, there's one alpha for every training set element. And one, once one actually goes through the entire solution finding process, so the optimizing this function here, what you what we discover is that our alphas our alphas are equal to our errors prediction errors divided by gamma so alphas and errors are specifically related to one another all right let's move that one out of the way um, the the key here is that even though these fees can give us quite large feature vectors we have this inner product of the, the two fees, and we can substitute that in, substitute that with our kernel function. So then the function 
drops down to this. And as we saw before, this kernel function can actually be quite inexpensive to compute. Okay, so let me make a couple of quick points about uh, this observation here. Because the alphas are proportional to the prediction errors, what this means is that our, the training samples where we're making our biggest prediction errors are the ones that influence this sum the most. And in fact, the, the training samples for which errors are either zero or very close to zero, they don't even matter in this sum relative to what the other training set elements can contribute. And, and this actually, this is flipped from our support vector classification uh, case where we actually, we were selecting alphas that were uh, zero for the points that were far away from the dividing line and keeping uh, interesting alphas for the, the cases where we were right on the, the margin boundary or inside the, the margin boundary. So that's the first point. But, but this idea that the, the training set samples for which we are predicting very poorly being the ones that influence the, the ultimate model uh, the most, this is actually the, the case for uh, least mean squared prediction in general. So those outlier samples that, that show up in our training set are the ones that get to drag that function around, whether we're explicitly working in that W space or whether we're working within this tool space. So, so it does feel a little bit counterintuitive, but it actually turns out to be the same kind of solution that we uh, see even with least mean squared linear regression. Okay, so that's the, the very high level view of support vector regression mathematically. I encourage you to go and look at the mathematics. It's, it's actually uh, quite fascinating to see the Lagrangian multipliers being used uh, to uh, derive this uh, particular set of solutions. But uh, next up for us is is to do a little bit of code in this area.